Well, hello everyone. My name is Darren Wilson. Uh, recently, the Property Share Market Economics team recorded our seventh Boom Bust Bulletin webinar early in April. And during that recording, we gave attendees an opportunity to pose their own questions to our two special guests. One, of course, was Philip J. Anderson, but the other joins me tonight. His name was Akil Patel. Akil, how are you today? Yeah, very well. Thanks for having me, Darren. I'm sure you agree that we had uh, an enormous response in terms of the questions that were posed to you. Yeah. Um, so many of them that we decided we, we should do a recording and actually go through them all one by one. Yeah, yeah, more than happy to. Great. So for the benefit of those people who did attend but didn't have their questions answered, uh, you guys are our focus tonight. And we'll start from this from the uh, very first question, which was quite pertinent, actually. And it was about the Australian property market and just how in sync is it with the one in the UK and in the United States? Uh, it's pretty much in sync. Um I think we've always said, and I, I've, I'm pretty sure we said it during the webinar, that the US is the key market to watch. US leads the world into and out of each cycle. Uh, it tends to peak first. So you, what's happening in the US will then appear in, in the UK and Australia later. Maybe the UK is slightly ahead of Australia. Um, of course, certain specific factors have a, have a bearing on what's going on in a particular market. So you know what's happening in the commodities space is quite important for Australia, but commodities themselves in many ways are also aligned with parts of the real estate cycle, particularly the phase that we're in at the moment. Uh, so yes, it's in sync. And that's also true of other markets, Europe. Um, you know, we're looking to see, you know, Japan, we're looking to see whether China and India are sort of following that pattern as well. Uh, we have a bit less history, so it's a bit less clear. Right. Um PSE has gone to great lengths um, to make sure that our members know that this real estate cycle actually is a truly global event this time, yeah. with yeah. almost the whole world uh, involved in it. But one of the questions on the night pertaining to the Chinese and Hong Kong stock markets, and they were saying that those markets seem to be well down off their highs in yeah. comparison to, say, the United States equity markets. Do you have any thoughts on why that may be the case? Yeah, I mean, look, the reality is that uh, every country has some specific factors. And, and, you know, China is very central government dominated society um, and they have very broad powers to intervene in the economy. Uh, and they have done that. Um, you know, I think they have concerns, actually legitimate concerns about inequality. And, you know, that's fed into how companies have performed because, you know, it affects sort of company earnings and so on. Um, not to mention that, um, you know, a good chunk of those markets are financial stocks. The government intervenes in the finance sector in a major way, et cetera. So, so I'm not surprised that it's off the highs. Um, we wrote a recent piece for our PSE members about, you know, particular patterns in the ch Chinese stock market into the peak, which I think is, uh, you know, potentially going to happen again. So time will tell. Yeah, that's actually a good point about the level of government interference that the um, Chinese government seems to have. Another area that it seems to be quite involved in is its real estate sector. And I yeah. believe one person on the night mentioned that um, along with their stock market, the mm -hmm. Chinese real estate market looks uh, quite bad or lagging compared to its Western equivalents. And they pose that is that evidence that the Chinese government is actually pouring resources into the more productive parts of the economy, say the consumer sector or exports, yeah. um, at the expense of their real estate stock? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it's a really good question. Uh, I'm not by any means a China expert, uh, and even even if I were, I don't think I would get uh, <laughs> I would get sort of hold of proper data. But my understanding is from talking to people who are there that you know things are going gangbusters in China. So clearly, there's an economic boom of some sort in some parts of China. Um, yes, there's a very significant government push for Chinese companies to dominate the industries of the future, whether they're electric vehicles or robotics or AI and other things, and that means there's been a lot of investment in real productive new industry development and uh, you know we know historically when china puts its mind to something it does so 
quite successfully and, and very quickly you might waste a lot of resources but it does does get there um and yeah i think there were some genuine concerns that um Chinese savers just stuck all their money into real estate, regardless of the value or the relationship between price and rents and so on. Uh, and it was making housing just simply, you know, I mean, really crazy in terms of price relative to to median wages. Uh, and they've attempted to do something about it. It's not been pretty, but uh, I think what the markets outside China have seemed to have viewed that is it's basically contained because the communist party is totally in charge of the economy now that might not be true but it seems to be what the markets have said at the moment uh, that's um very interesting and yeah you you are right you speak to something that is an impediment for us in our research is that uh, level of interference and just how sure can you be with the data um we've moved from china now into the subcontinent and india place i know that's close to your heart akil and um, we recently wrote a Bus bulletin about the amount of infrastructure that India is building because it became very apparent just yeah. how much of an impact they're going to have for the remainder of this current global real estate cycle. But yeah. someone mentioned, um, what are our thoughts? The Indian land market actually does experience a cycle much like the United States. And will their land market peak actually time with the United States or not? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I said at the beginning that uh, I think it's a you know we both think we 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 think it's a global cycle uh, and they follow the U.S. So I my hypothesis is until I'm shown otherwise that India follows the U.S. Um, but there there are a couple of things. One is you know there's not enough data and maybe it's possible it has its own timing and it is you know we know from the 19th century that where the UK and the US had different timings to their 18 year cycles. It's possible for two major economies to have different sort of timing. Uh, so maybe India might be that, but until I see evidence of that, I'm not going to say that's my kind of working hypothesis because what we've seen since the Second World War is that cycles get more synchronized uh, over time. But the second thing is that India has enormous potential. It's, you know, it lags quite considerably behind China uh, and so on, but it's relatively, uh, it's coming from a fairly socialist background, but it's, you know, relatively capitalist now, um, you know, the prime minister is trying to deal with corruption and actually, you know, stop all this bureaucracy and so on. And that's unleashed a wave of investment all over the place, you know, rails, roads, new businesses, uh, all that kind of stuff, ports, etc. Um, and so, you know, we know from our study of economics, law of economic rent, that whenever infrastructure goes in, land prices go up. Uh, and Indians, uh, like any other uh, kind of nation love buying property and and so on uh, and so so that is leads to to a major boom in in sort of property and also um in kind of speculation and so on um there are you know interest rates have been high uh for quite some time i'm not quite sure what they're doing now um but you know that might have been a bit of a barrier but people are putting a lot of money into the real estate sector so maybe it is a bit too early to ascertain whether they truly do have a, a, a real estate cycle. Well, it's, yeah, and also there's so much potential, a bit like Japan in the mm -hmm. 70s. You know, they had a downturn in the 1970s, similar to similar to the US and Europe. But because there was so much going on in Japan, it sort of recovered quite quickly out of that. Um, and maybe we'll see the same thing with India. If it, Even if it is, timing is the same as the US, maybe it will sort of lead the charge in the next cycle. I don't know. These are all things that are fascinating, can't be definitive now. Um, I think people who are asking the right questions, I think they really ought to uh, be members of, of PSE because we're going to be exploring all of these things and, and trying to ascertain what's going on over the next few years. Excellent. Our next question actually brings us back to my home country here in, in Australia. We had quite a few people on the night um, asking about the wisdom of purchasing in regional areas um, such as uh, regional Queensland or regional New South Wales. Um, in this late in the cycle. Do you have any thoughts about what people should do and how they should uh, approach such a decision at this late stage of the cycle? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And it's not, I don't think this question is really specific to Queensland or to or to Australia. It's a general point. Um, I can't, I don't know enough about what is being considered, but the principle is that um, you have to buy real estate based upon its sort of fundamentals. You know, a piece of property earns rent, and so on. If you're 
purchasing that sort of flow of rent for a reasonable price and you can service your debt and you know you know up you know sort of keep the property in good condition and find tenants and it's it's in an area where people are moving to where there's stuff going on all that sort of thing then it's fine you've you've bought an asset at a reasonable price and it's going to deliver value to you and it doesn't matter where in the cycle of course it's better to buy right at the beginning but you know if that's your investment strategy and that's what you've got some surplus that you want to invest then it's uh, then it's fine if you're buying something because you think well it's quite expensive in relation to its rents but i know it's going to be worth something more tomorrow uh and so i'm going to go for the capital gain to kind of make the numbers stack up that starts to become a bit dangerous and it becomes more and more dangerous the further you get into towards the peak of the cycle so if you go down that route, then you really want to make sure you're in a good location and demand is not going to dry up very considerably in a downturn. Because what you tend to find is the cycle ripples out. And as you get further out from you know the main areas of population and so on, it becomes more speculative and you're more vulnerable uh, in the downturn. So bottom line is do your homework, do your due diligence, don't do anything silly. Uh, and if if that is the case, if you have you know done your research, and it's, it seems like a reasonable prospect, then I think it's okay. You know, you just bear in mind that you you might not be able to sell for a few years because you're you'd have to ride out the the end of the cycle and the start of the next one and so on. So if your time horizon is long enough, it's fine. If it's not, then you might want to consider doing something else. I think the part about uh, research that is so pertinent. And if I can just add, uh, Akil, just a, a, a small Australian flavour to this. The Australian Bureau of Statistics, when it's measuring the impact of our massive immigration policy that we've had for about 18 months to two years here, they include places like the Gold Coast as a regional city. Now, the Gold Coast has almost a million people there. And right. if you remove some of these bigger places, you'll find that 90% of immigrants are still going to those prime capital cities in Australia. So the right, demand right. that people may think here in Australia are moving to regional areas, which may encourage them to purchase, actually the figures are slightly fudged. So, I mean, it's it's a difficult line to walk, isn't it, at times? Well, I think I th this is, I mean, we're now getting into some pretty uh, important territory. Um, and I'll make one final general point and then we can maybe move on to the next question. But, but. Yes. I mean, you always get very authoritative forecasts of these sorts of things towards the peak. Because I know someone ultimately is trying to sell you something. So they pick on these stats. And, you know, these stats are very sensitive to assumptions or decisions like you just mentioned about, you know, how you group things and categorize things. And it builds a narrative about where people are moving to. Just be quite careful about that sort of thing is all I'd say. And this doesn't just apply in, in the Gold Coast. It applies other parts of, uh, of the world as well. Here's a question that I'm sure will um, ring a few bells because I think we've had it in every subsequent webinar we've had, and that is which peaks first? Is it the stock market or is it the land market? Uh, well, this is a really good question. Uh, my feeling it's the land market in the US. Um, you know, so global stock markets are a bit more synchronised than land markets. I think the US land market peaks first and the stock market continues to go up for some time. Problem is we don't really properly measure land values um, and certainly not regularly with a proper appraisal and so on. And so we don't, we're sort of somewhat guessing what's going on in the land market. Um, and, uh, and you know, land is a locational asset. So, you know, it's quite hard to interpret what the data is necessarily showing. Um, land market in the US peaks first, then the stock markets. Um, now, there may be some variation to that in the sense that the, the time lag between the peak in the land cycle and the peak in the stock market might be quite considerable. It might be some years, in, in, you know, as in the 1920s. Um, and the run up to that peak in the stock market might be some really big years. And so this is where having sort of some access or some understanding of how the land market is behaving is really important. That gives you, I think, the edge that we try and give investors and people who are subscribers to our service. Speaking of the land market, we actually had a gentleman here, and I'll, I'll read this ad verbatim because so I want to make sure I get this point. But the question was posed, why did Australian house prices only decline for about one to two years or 10 to 15 percent in the last 2008 recession? And what are the chances of that happening again? 
both here in Australia and across the world, at the end of this cycle? Yeah, good question. Um, look, the, the, some of some of this is sort of fairly old territory for us. I mean, we pointed out that there was a commodities boom into 2008, and that's obviously good for Australia. Uh, and then the Chinese and US economies had massive stimulus packages, which they passed in late 2008, early 2009, which really stimulated the economy. And we had another wave of uh, surge in commodity prices into 2011. Again, good for, for Australia and parts of Australia. Um, that was obviously the Australian economy was flush with cash. There was a massive stimulus. You know, everyone went out and bought TVs, I think, um, that sort of thing. So it kept... It kept, you know, spending relatively high, wages high, and so on, um, and the downturn limited, uh, and so that fed into the property market. Now, that's not to say that every location in Australia only went down for a couple of years and down by ten or fifteen percent. My understanding is from talking to someone who was a property person in Darwin, I think it was in two thousand eight, said there's a lot of places where that had been built again on this idea that you know everyone's moving to Darwin, the edge of Darwin and so on. Yeah. And a lot of mining towns. Really, yeah, which really, which really sort of suffered uh in the in the in the downturn. So so the, you know the 10 to 15 thing is only a general rule, but it was linked to commodities. Now whether whether it will happen again in after 2026, which is our forecast peak, um I don't know. Uh, it's you know it sort of depends on what happens in the commodity cycle. We'll have peaked that in in that cycle as well. The downturn might be much more significant in Australia than um, than people have experienced, and that would sort of make sense because you tend to find that if you have a really bad downturn in one cycle, the memory of that sort of lingers a little bit uh, in the in the next one. Maybe the boom is less significant. People still remember maybe they're a bit more cautious. Australia didn't really have that sort of experience after 2008. And so, so maybe that's uh, going to be a telling factor. But again, as I've said, hard to say now, something we're definitely considering very actively. Uh, and so I think you want to be part of the part of the membership to be sort of actively involved in hearing our thoughts as they're updated. Yeah, speaking of the membership, you know, every Blue Bus Bulletin uh, webinar we do run, we do go at lengths to explain how we think our research can help and assist people uh, yeah. through the cycle. And we've got one question I thought was just an outstanding one. How much do we focus on education versus advice in your subscription service? And I just thought that was an absolutely nailed on question. We had to ask it tonight. Yeah, I mean, look, we don't really give advice per se. I mean, it, it's not we're not a regulated company. It's not what we do. Uh, and also, we just have a very broad and diverse membership, and you know, everyone's circumstances are, are different. That said, we obviously put practical stuff out there, watch lists and roadmaps and all that sort of thing, uh, so that people can apply that to their own circumstances, their own investment strategies, and their own you know decisions. Um, but really, I mean, I think even just from these few questions, uh, you can probably tell, um, and certainly from our writing and from my book and from Phil's book, I think at, at our heart, Phil and I are really educators and we want people to really understand the cycle and how it works and why it works and why no one sees it and how you can sort of sort it out if you really wanted to in terms of creating a citizen's dividend and so on. So we're really, you know, you the educational part of it leaks out of us. We really want our subscribers to understand what we understand about the cycle, uh, but we also are very aware that it needs to be practical so that they can they can apply it uh, to their own circumstances. Uh, great response. Um, I, I go back to the, the webinar and I recall your um, uh, your presentation there at the start. And one of the things that grabbed a lot of people's attention on the night was you showed them a couple of our um, recent what we call stock market roadmaps. From, I yeah. think it was about 2020 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Now, someone asked the question, how best should people extrapolate and understand and read those actual charts that you showed on the night? Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, but also know that, you know, obviously they're for our valued PSC members only. So, Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. So, I mean, it is a forecast of the US, UK and Australian markets at the start of the year. And we 
you know, we say here is the context in which we're making a forecast for the year. This is where we are on the real estate cycle. Here are some of the things that have been going on. This is what you know we think is is likely to influence you know market action over the next twelve months. Then we have a series of forecast curves, uh, which gives a general shape our view of what the shape of the market is going to be in the key turning points in the year. Um, but the curves, you know, we 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 have like at least four different sort of curves and so four different scenarios. They tend to correspond actually quite well, but some might be slightly more bearish, some might be slightly more bullish. Uh, and we we keep those live during the year because what we find is as a, as a year unfolds, it starts to follow one or the other scenario depending on how bullish the action is. And you can only really tell that once the year starts, which is why I, I try to write at least once a month to um, our subscribers with an update of where we are with the curve and what's going on and uh, and so on. Um, I think the curves have, you know, as I showed on in the webinar, the curves have worked pretty well over the last few years, um, given how different the narrative at the start of each year has been to what subsequently happened. So, so I think I think people have found that um, a pretty valuable. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of how we we approach it. So it's a forecast of the year, which we then update, uh, and we see how the market action is is kind of following which scenario we've pointed out. And hopefully it gives you uh, a, a chance to consider when you might want to exit or en enter a stock or where you want to put some additional money in and so on. I mean, I actually probably ought to survey uh, our subscribers and ask them how they use it. But nonetheless, that's the sort of idea. And certainly that's how I use it when, I, when I'm looking at my own decisions. Let's end tonight's session with just one last very practical question, and that is, what are the places you'd like to invest in for the remainder of 2024? <laughs> yeah, I said that I refer to my previous comment about uh, um, uh, not giving advice. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, as you know, we put out some stuff. For, we put out watch lists and other things for our subscribers. Uh, I'm not going to go into those. Uh, but look, we some of the themes, I'll, give, I'll say this, some of the themes that we've talked about um, in the roadmap this year, but also in our updates is sort of around commodities, um, you know, some of the commodity uh, areas, of, uh, some of the um, different commodities in the suite uh, are starting to move quite significantly. Uh, and, you know, therefore mining and other resource companies related to those are doing well. That's one thing. Um, I do think interest rates will come down. I think that will be very good for property. Um, so again, notwithstanding my earlier comments, property might be a good investment. The stock market should have some very good years, you know. So that's that's all that's all good. Um, any ideas within that, of course, for our subscribers. So um definitely encourage you all to to really consider signing up. Uh, yeah, I second that motion. Akil, I'm intimately familiar with just how busy you are. So I want to thank you for finding the time today to record this session with me. I think it's been very enlightening and I hope whether you're an attendee of the webinar or not, that you find the answers here uh, illuminating and useful. So thank you very much for your time, Akil. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, so did I. And hopefully we'll do another one of these um, in the near future. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. See ya.